Zora Neale Hurston was an anthropologist and writer who had a significant impact on American literature, especially African American literature. She played a key role in what was known as the Harlem Renaissance of the 1930s, and her books continue to inspire readers today. Gary Richards is a professor of English at Mary Washington University in Virginia. Gary Richards, who was Zora Neale Hurston, and what did she bring to American literature? Zora Neale Hurston was, without doubt, one of the most important writers of the 20th century United States literary scene. Um, What I love about Hurston is she brought in a woman's voice, she brought in an African-American voice, and she would say, very importantly, She brought in a Southern voice to American literature, particularly in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, So she was part of the Harlem Renaissance and was a unique voice within that grouping in American literature. She was born in 1891 in Alabama. Tell us, Gary Richards, about her early years there, her family, and those early influences. Sure. Um, As you said, Hurston was born in Alabama. She was the granddaughter of enslaved people. Um, She did not live, though, in Alabama long. Um, Very early on, um, her father relocated to central Florida, um, where there were opportunities there um, to be had in an all-black town. And after he scoped it out, um, this was Eatonville, Florida. It's in the Orlando area. The family relocated there. So Hurston had really from her earliest memories um, being part of a large family, but also within a town that was um, black run, black um, controlled. Um, It was not without its tensions, but she throughout her life said that she felt that that was very unique to grow up in kind of autonomous black enclave um, as far as civic life there in Eatonville, Florida. Um, The other thing that I think was probably important about Hurston's childhood was uh, it was a large family and she was down the line. She was not her father's favorite daughter, but she was very, very close to her mother. Um, However, her mother died when she was um, an early teenager, and this was pretty devastating for Hurston. Um, Her father remarried very quickly after that to a woman that um, Zora did not care for, and Zora was sent off to school, which she interpreted as something of her father rejecting her. Um, So, She, as I said earlier, a very unique childhood, but feeling like she had the um, good luck to be born in that, to be raised in that black community, um, but really suffered with the loss of her mother mother when she died. She did find her way to a a formal education at Barnard College in Columbia, but let's talk first about... um, a couple of uh, uh, interesting aspects about uh, Hurston. We we know her, of course, as an acclaimed writer, but she was also a trained anthropologist, which I assume to a large extent informed her writing. Where did those two interests come from, and how did she hone those skills and then ultimately pull them together? Well, I think that anthropologists and fiction writers share in common that they are both very close observers of lived experience. Um, So she did have the good luck as her education continued. She went from Barnard then, I think, to Columbia, where she worked with Franz Boas, who was one of the leading anthropologists at the time, very concerned about folklore, et cetera. Um, And as I said earlier, growing up in Eatonville, she had been just awash with black folklore, with black stories, with black idioms. Um, And she, I think, wanted to document those things. That was the anthropologist in her, um, having a record of them, but also then as the fiction writer, use those to reach a different audience. Um, So I would say from the beginning, those two were informing one another, Um, sometimes to her detriment, that one of the things that that particularly for people who are still invested in the formalist aspects of literature, um, 
sometimes they are disappointed that Hurston is not the most persnickety of uh, formalist, um, that she is a haphazard plotter, things like that. Um, she will have awkward asides, but it's almost as if the anthropology is so propelling her, she wants to get as much of the language in there, and so not paying as much attention um, to kind of the, the niceties of writing fiction. But I think on the other hand, that gives her fiction an energy that many other writers of that time period um, does not have. Um, Because she's got um, the well-turned phrase, because she's got kind of these larger-than-life characters, um, real life almost echoing um, the stories that she heard in those folk tales. She did travel extensively throughout the southern U.S. as part of research and the the Caribbean. Uh, Gary Richards, how was she received in those places when she planted herself there to do her anthropological work? How did they view her? She had to be very careful um, and integrate herself within those communities. um, That she, this is where being, I think, an authentic black Southerner who grew up with those um, folk ways, um, she was able to slip in and become one of those. When she went, for instance, to New Orleans to do study on hoodoo and other um, kind of voodoo elements there, um, she went through the rituals herself to become, in some ways, a practitioner, et cetera, um, and treating them seriously, treating them honestly. I think that was something that, say, a white anthropologist like Franz Boas um, could never do. Um, that she really did try um, to become part of the community. Um, a parallel I think about is when Truman Capote was writing In Cold Blood, and he was trying to integrate himself into the community. He couldn't do it. Harper Lee could. I think Harper Lee and Zora Neale Hurston had that of becoming one of the people as they were gathering information. As a writer, as part of that Harlem Renaissance we're talking about, I suppose the mid-1920s, heading into the uh, 30s, tell us more about that part of her life uh, in New York. What, And, and, and more specifically, I'm, I'm interested in knowing, what were her goals as a writer? What kind of stories was she trying to tell, and what made those stories different? As I suggested earlier, what I think Hurston was trying to do was document um, Black Southern experiences. Um, Being in New York, surrounded by people who were often of higher classes, of kind of more advanced backgrounds than she was, um, she felt that They were perhaps um, taking over the Harlem Renaissance, creating a certain tone to it that had the urban experience, the upper middle class um, black experience kind of as a defining one. I think she wanted to provide a counter to that um, to bring in those communities that she had grown up with um, in the South um, to give, I think, a well-rounded representation uh, of black life in the United States. Um, She was something of a disruptor, deliberately so. She was not always the most reliable person, um, but she would burst into a gathering, um, become part of a group, and really bring energy and fun and um, often very frank um, observation. Sometimes pricking the uh, self-importance of some of the other members of the Harlem Renaissance, even some of the very respected older generation of black civic leaders like W.B. Du Bois, for instance. Um, she once quipped um, that he was Dr. Dubious, for instance. That uh, leads me to my next uh, question, Gary Richards. So by the time 1937 comes around, her uh, one of her key works, if not her key work, her key novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, is published. Um, what was the reaction to that book when it came out? The reaction was largely positive, um, although by that point, the Harlem Renaissance was losing a little bit of steam, um, but it was not universally beloved as a novel. Uh, there were, for instance, um, several African-American critics who 
felt that the novel was not political enough. Um, in the 1930s, you have kind of as a rising figure, um, the black writer Richard Wright, who felt very strongly that the black writer was to be politically engaged, to be showing the oppression of African Americans in the United States at the time. And what Hurston had done in Their Eyes Were Watching God was really look at a black woman's negotiating um, kind of her coming into being within black community. So it, instead of being an interracial exploration, it was an intraracial one. And um, so she did have some negative reviews that it was um, not achieving what a politically engaged black writer should do. Um, I think for us now in the 21st century, looking back on it, um, it's also what we might refer to as the intersectionality of the novel, looking at um, a black woman. What is it like to be a woman and to be Southern and to be, in the case of Janie Crawford, um, middle class and even at times of her life, lower class, how those play out within kind of an all black environment. Was that book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, or any of her books, uh, big commercial successes? No. I mean, that, that they did well enough. But by the time we get to the 1940s, um, she is out of vogue. She had also become a little bit more politically conservative. Um, and it's one of the, the famous tales of American literature that by the time we get to the 1950s, um, Hurston is basically impoverished. In the 20s and 30s, she was making a living with her um, publishing, but also kind of being associated with various universities where she would often work to create um, dramatic productions and things like that. So she was drawing on kind of a, a range of incomes. Um, she also had various patrons, um, typically white patrons, who would fund her research. Um, that was, though, often with strings attached to it. So um, Mrs. Osgood Mason, for instance, was one of the people who funded Hurston's um, anthropological research, but really wanted control how Hurston disseminated it. So in order to keep afloat um, financially, she often had to enter into kind of devil's bargains like that. What kind of personal relationships did she have uh, during her life? Was she married? She was married three times in three extraordinarily brief marriages. Um, she, from everything that I have read, is that she did enjoy the gentleman. Um, she had a uh, ongoing relationship with quite a few of them, but three of them she formally married. Um, but the marriages we're talking about often lasting less than a year. Um, often they would just dissipate, and um, she didn't seem to be particularly concerned about being a three times divorced woman either. Do you know if she was a religious person, a person of faith? She was raised in a household um, led by her father, who was a Baptist minister. So she definitely grew up in a Protestant background. Like so many modernist writers, she evolved away, I believe, from kind of traditional Christian belief. That said, those narratives, um, like folklore um, from her childhood, really impacted her throughout her life. So um, when you think about her first novel, the title Jonas Gordvine is an allusion to the biblical figure of uh, Jonah. Her third novel was a novelization about Moses. So that novel is entitled Moses, Man of the Mountain. Um, one of her most famous short stories, The Gilded Six Vents, many critics read as a fictionalization of the Garden of Eden. So I would say that she is very similar to a figure like William Faulkner, raised in the Protestant South, steeped in those narratives, grew away from actual belief, but continued to use that as yet another literary source, really for the entirety of her life. Back to her politics, the politics of uh, Zora Neale Hurston. I, I did read that she was a Republican. What did that mean at that time? And did she have any particular political figures that she liked or disliked? <laughs> 
I think we have to keep in mind that Hurston being born in 1891, Republican would still have meant for many African Americans at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the party that was associated with liberation. You know, so it makes sense in some ways historically that African Americans um, would have that investment. She was not a particular fan of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, she actually supported Republicans who ran against him um, throughout the 30s and the 40s. You had mentioned earlier uh, the latter part of her life, uh, Gary Richards, um, relative obscurity until a certain point when, um, if I read it correctly, Alice Walker became active in the story of Zora Neale Hurston, actually went down to Florida. What, what, what was Alice Walker's role in sort of revitalizing um, her, her reputation? I think Walker was paradigmatic of a whole group of women in particular um, in the 1970s who were looking to bring feminist, and in Walker's case, womanist discourses um, to U.S. literature, to look for genealogies, to look for traditions of women writers. And for Walker, herself a writer in, who had come onto the national scene in the 60s and the 70s, um, looking to who those literary foremothers were. And for Walker, as a person who grew up in rural Georgia, she really saw Hurston from one to two generations ahead of her as someone who had anticipated her. So wanting that literary form of her to have recognition, to have her novels and short stories be taught again, literally to placing a marker on Hurston's grave. Um, we know now that it the, the grave was actually slightly um, uh, elsewhere in the cemetery, and uh, Hurston had long propagated that her birth was 1901, um, and those are the things that are on the stone that Walker helped um, to put there. But I think it was that permanence of wanting to have Hurston have her recognition um, to bring her back into the canon. And this is what we saw going on um, really throughout the 1970s and 1980s um, with black um, female writers, with white female writers, with those of other races. Um, and Walker was absolutely crucial um, to putting Hurston back on the radar where, incidentally, um, she's never left um, in the last 40 years. Let me ask you, as a college professor, what does teaching about Zora Neale Hurston's uh, books mean to students today and draw that line between then and now and what students see when they uh, when they read that book and, 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 and get the lectures about it? I think for students um, now, um, it is knowing that almost 80 years ago, someone was giving this narrative of a, in the case of the protagonist with the eyes of watching God, a woman who goes through a series of marriages and ultimately ends with her kind of standing alone, how she has grown to cope. Um, I think that resonates in particular for um, students who identify as women. I think for African-American students and other non-white students to have kind of the monumentalism of this achievement. Um, but Hurston brings with her challenges now. Um, she was something of a belated realist. And so working out of her anthropological instincts, um, she writes in dialect, and many, many students um, are find that the dialect is very, very hard to get through. So ironically, we're finding Hurston not quite a having the same rapport that maybe she had 20 or 30 years ago, um, that her language is now ironically working against her, the very thing that you know drew so much attention to her. And finally, uh, Gary Richards, um, uh, a broad question about the legacy of Zora Neale Hurston. What is that legacy? What do I think that legacy is? Yes, sir. I think that she, at least on the academic perspective, will continue to be taught 
for the foreseeable future because of that energy, because of documenting a certain type of black voice. And she also dialogues so nicely, often in contrasting ways with her fellow writers. As a person who teaches Southern literature, U.S. literature, African-American literature, to put Hurston and Wright in dialogue, um, to have students weigh when is it efficacious to be overtly political? When is it efficacious to not be overtly political? Um, how does one draw attention to racial injustice, um, gender injustice, other things like that? Um, how does one do it? What are the trade-offs? Those are issues that I think we face in a range of ways in 2023, um, just as Wright and Hurston were doing that back in the 30s. Um, so I think they remain pertinent and timely, and she's just an amazing writer. Gary Richards is an English professor at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. Thanks a lot for your time. It was my pleasure talking with you, Paul. Thanks for listening to the Books That Shaped America podcast. For more information about the series, you can visit our website, cspan.org slash books that shaped America. And remember to follow this podcast so you never miss an episode.